we begin our quarantine week uh, number six, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to pre-record a Bible lesson for this week, uh, the week of April the 20th. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn to Philippians chapter number four, and we're going to look specifically at verses six through seven. I wanted to talk about this idea of worry and how we can take the words of Paul and overcome our fear of worry and the problems that accompany worrying in our lives. Um, as we think about this, um, maybe this is a topic that does not affect you. Uh, maybe you are one of those kind of individuals that are just extremely positive and blessed and you have the ability to go through life without a lot of worry or concern. Well, I'm very envious of you because I have had a problem with worry and um, I will tell you that left unchecked and left to its own, Worry can become a real problem. Uh, it can become a problem both uh, with our mental health, our emotional health, our physical health, and yes, even our spiritual health. So as, uh, as, I, as I work through the Word of God today, I'm really teaching to myself uh, more than anyone else and reminding myself and uh, encouraging myself through the Word of God that even in times like this, um, there, there is no need to worry. Um, there is a need to be informed. There is a need to be concerned. And we certainly need to be sensitive to all of those around us and the needs that are around us. But to be consumed by worry and to allow worry to go unchecked is nothing but a tool that the devil uses to discourage us. So as we look at uh, the words here in Philippians, uh, let's open our hearts and our minds and be receptive to what God is teaching us through his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that it is a balm to our soul, that um, it is encouragement to our downtrodden hearts. And Father, through it, we can find answers to the issues of life and we can find the encouragement that we need to go forward. So I pray that you bless our time in your word today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, worry does not solve any of our problems, does it? I can think back of all of the years that I've worried and worried and worried, and all of that worry amounted to nothing. It didn't change any circumstance in my life. It didn't make things any better. It didn't make things any worse. It made me feel worse, but it did not change my circumstances. Um, in researching uh, for the lesson today, there's a statistic that I thought was very interesting, and I'll share it with you. 40% of the things that we worry about will never happen. 30% of what we worry about is the past which can't be changed anyway. 12% is worry is from criticism by other people. Most of that, which is untrue. 10% of our worries are, uh, are usually with our health. And even there, too much stress can make our health worse. And so only 8% of what we worry about as worriers are real problems that probably should have some concern around them. But even those 8% of the problems that we worry about are problems that have resolution, are problems that can be solved. How would you like to be able to overcome your worry? Um, would you love to be able to take all of that negative energy that goes into worry and channel it into positive emotional well-being and feeling. And I'll tell you, I, I want that, and I need that, and I need to continually remind myself 
of these words that Paul is going to share with us. I, I have worked very hard and, uh, and have gotten to a point where most of the time I can see a glass that's half full instead of half empty. So let's see what Paul tells us here about this idea of worry and, um, and how we can overcome it. Um, I want us to read Philippians chapter number 4. Uh, we're going to be looking in verses 6 and 7. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Paul writes, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. If anyone ever had reason to worry, it was the Apostle Paul, was it not? As he writes this book of Philippians, one of the prison epistles, he is imprisoned in a Roman jail cell, uh, far from home, far from his family, far from his friends. By now, Paul knew that most likely he faced a death sentence, so he would probably never leave Rome. The New Testament book of Philippians was penned by Paul, and it was to one of the churches that he had planted in one of his missionary trips. So he's writing to them. If there was anyone that ever had a reason um, to be full of self-pity, to be full of doubt, blame, discouragement, a huge sob story, worry, um, it would be Paul. Paul, sitting there in the Rome, in Rome, in a Roman jail cell, was anything but full of worry, full of fear, full of discouragement. No, it was something that was wonderful because Paul penned one of the most joyful books that we have in the Bible, Philippians, a letter to the Philippian church of joy, of promise, of encouragement. And uh, we can learn so much from these words that Paul wrote to us and the Philippians uh, almost 2,000 years ago. You see, Paul found the secret. Joy only comes through Christ and Christ alone. Happiness and joy are two different things. I'm sure that Paul was probably not happy in that Roman jail cell. He would have much rather been free to travel, to visit the churches that he had planted, to start new churches, to continue to share the good news, news gospel. No, he was not a happy man, but Paul was a man full of joy because he completely trusted in Jesus Christ, even in the midst of circumstances that would cause a normal person to worry and to fret. You see, joy can be defined as that quiet, confident assurance that God is at work in our lives. Even when we feel imprisoned by our circumstances or by our family or by um, other issues in our lives, we can feel that emotional and spiritual and mental imprisonment. But joy is that quiet assurance, that quiet confidence that even in the midst of of all of that, God is quietly but methodically and productively working in our lives. So happiness would be the contrast to joy because you see joy runs much deeper and much stronger than happiness does. And that's what Paul was filled with there in that Roman jail cell. He was filled with joy. And even today, we can take his words, his instructions, and we can apply that to our lives today. And we too can develop that quiet, competent assurance of joy because we trust in Christ and Christ alone. 
Let's look at three things Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Number one, be anxious for nothing. Uh, some of the translations use the word anxious. Uh, the New Living Translation that I read from uses the word worry, but it's one in the same. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. And notice that Paul says about anything. So be anxious for nothing. Our situation, our family, our finances, the past, the future, Paul is telling us, don't be anxious for that. Don't have a spirit of anxiety, a spirit of fretfulness. You know, Satan is so very clever, and he is so very deceitful. He is the master manipulator of what we'll call the three deadly D's, and that would be distraction and discouragement and doubt. Satan will distract us with circumstances from keeping our eyes on Jesus. Um, Satan will bring discouragement into our lives uh, to prevent us from growing in the faith and, and from enduring in Christ Jesus. And then he will bring doubt into our minds. Make no mistake about it. Satan is very clever, and so we need to be on guard against being anxious for nothing. Secondly, we are then, if we are not to be anxious for anything or worry about anything, then we are to be, look there in verse number uh, seven, then we are to be prayerful. There, there's a principle of replacement here. So if we are to take our worry, our propensity for worry, and we are to remove it from our minds and our hearts, then we need to backfill that with something. And what we backfill that with is prayer. We are prayerful about everything. We, we delete anxious, we delete worry, we delete anxiety, and we replace it all with prayer. Basically, we take the worry and turn it into a prayer. Let me give you a personal example. Uh, when mine and Wanda's two children, um, Nathaniel and Autumn, were in school, they were in Charleston, South Carolina. And we had a little family tradition that we did every Sunday afternoon when they would come home and visit home and then head back to Charleston Sunday evening. We always gathered right outside the garage. We held hands as a family and we prayed for their safe passage back to Charleston, South Carolina. And we knew about how much time it took to drive. And so I was one that would begin to worry or begin to fret if I didn't hear back from them in the amount of time that I thought they should safely arrive in Charleston at school. And so I, I learned to take that worry and that fret and basically replace it with a prayer. And the prayer would go something like this. It would go, Lord, Please watch over Nathaniel and Autumn as they drive and as they travel back to school in Charleston, South Carolina. Keep them safe, keep them from harm's way, and give them traveling mercies, Lord. And I'm already thanking you, Lord, for that answer to the prayer of their safe arrival in Charleston. So you see, you're replacing uh, anxiousness and anxiety with prayer. You're turning that into a prayer. Let me tell you this, fretting only magnifies the problem. Yep, fretting, F-R-E-T-T-I-N-G, only magnifies the problem. Prayer, however, magnifies God. I heard this a long, long time ago at a marriage uh, conference or a marriage enrichment retreat. If you have a big God in your life, you're going to have little problems. If you have a little God in your life, you're going to have big problems. That always stuck with me. Do you know if you take the smallest coin and you hold it closely to your eye, that little coin will block out the sunlight. Thirdly, as we are anxious about nothing, as we worry about nothing, and as we replace that with prayer for everything, uh, let's be thankful for all things. 
Look there in Paul's writings where he tells us, he says that we should thank him for all that he has done. This idea is, is to refocus our mind from our problems and our circumstances and those things that would cause us worry and anxiety and focus them in a much more positive place. And that's what Christ has done for us in our lives, saving us, caring for us, providing for us, defending us, encouraging us, um, all the blessings that come. Remember, Paul was confined in a Roman prison cell, and yet he never lost his joy because of worry. So look at what all God has done for us. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. One of the, the great hymns that we've sung through the faith for years. Uh, we must learn to be grateful for what God has done in our past and in our present so that we can have faith and look to him for what he is going to do in the future. That is how we are thankful in all things. Gratitude is important because gratitude, an, a, an attitude of gratitude, it has the power to change our negative attitude and give us that opportunity to have a positive attitude. When we practice these three steps, anxious for nothing, prayerful about everything, and thankful for all things. When we do this, something in us will begin to change. There will be a personal discipline that will be, you'll sense it, you'll feel it. It will begin to come into your heart and into your mind, and you will be more able, as I have been in my life, you will be more able to clearly see Christ as he sees life. You know, obstacles are always going to be there. Challenges, yes, always going to be there. Even in this time now, when we face the global concerns of the pandemic, um, the uncertainty of jobs, um, it, it, all of these, yes, will be part of our life. But obstacles have the potential to become opportunities. This is a time when we can really, really buckle down and put our trust in Christ and Christ alone and see what great things he will do for us and in us. Because you see, when we believe that and practice what Paul tells us, then fear will flee. Fear will flee. Be anxious for nothing. Be prayerful about everything and be thankful for all things. I want to finish our Bible study uh, at this time with um, a little poem. It's a little different, um, so bear with me as, uh, as I read through it. But um, in her book, um, Having a Merry Heart in a Martha World, author Joanna Weaver writes a different version of the 23rd Psalm. Uh, the, the name of her 23rd Psalm is, The Lord is my pace setter. Listen as I read. The Lord is my pace setter. I shall not rush. He makes me stop for quiet intervals. He provides me with images of stillness which restore my serenity. He leads me in the way of efficiency through calmness of mind, and his guidance is peace. Even though I have a great many things to accomplish each day, I will not fret, for his presence is here. His timelessness, his all-importance will keep me in balance. He prepares refreshment and renewal in the midst of my activity, by anointing my mind with his oils of tranquility. My cup of joyous energy overflows. Truly, harmony and effectiveness shall be the fruits of my hours, for I shall walk in the pace of my Lord and dwell in his house forever. Hey, let me ask you a question as we finish up today. Who is setting the pace 
in your life.